of Zechariah. It's a little small prophetic book in the Old Testament. I'm going to read just one verse, but a month ago, I was preparing for something else, and I came across this verse, and I felt the Holy Ghost stir in my spirit, Easter. That doesn't always happen to me a month in advance. But for the last month, I've been stirred in my spirit, drawn to this thing. This is not a normal Easter Sunday message today. And, and I, I'll be honest with you, I'm sure about what I'm preaching, but I feel so inadequate. I ask people in the office before church to pray for me. I said, I feel so inadequate. I'm not eloquent enough to to really do this justice. But I pray somehow the Holy Ghost will make up the difference and that you can grasp what the Spirit of God is saying to us today. The prophet Zechariah in the Old Testament had a spiritual encounter with God and in that encounter that he wrote about that became part of our Bible, he foresaw a vision of the future of the Messiah. And speaking of the Messiah, talking about Jesus, though he didn't know his name would be Jesus at the time. But he noted this in verse 6, and that's all I want to read to start this morning. One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer, Those which which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Jesus, what's those scars in your hands? He said, all these. This came from the day that I was wounded in the house of my friends. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I want to preach this morning on a topic that I'm simply going to call Wasted Wounds wasted wounds. I want to ask you if you would sit your Bible down for a moment and would you just one more time as a body would you lift your voice and pray and ask God to help us today in the name of Jesus. Father thank you for your presence that I feel here and and I thank you for the people that have gathered and I'm asking you to do a marvelous work right now. Let the ministry of the word go forth and then let the ministry of the spirit take over and draw us as a people closer to you than we've ever been. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Before you're seated, greet four or five folks around you. Maybe you haven't greeted yet. and Bless them in the name of the Lord. Then you may be seated. There's an old idiom that we use that I've heard since I was a kid. It says, what you don't know won't hurt you. I have now lived long enough to know that that was a lie. (laughs) Because in reality, it isn't very true at all. As a matter of fact, The prophet Hosea recorded in the Old Testament a statement from the Lord himself when he said, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So the truth is, what we don't know can indeed hurt us. And it very much is problematic. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. But what if you don't know truth? Then that means evidently that we will not be able to become free. And sometimes we get confused about what's truth because of all the exaggerated exaggerations that are going on. We live in a time, for example, that's 
we don't really have news media anymore. We just have propaganda uh, media now. Whatever side or form of thinking you have, it's just everything's exaggerated toward that. And as a result, we hear things over and over again. Matter of fact, one of the issues of Marxism is just to say the same thing over and over and over and over again, and eventually it'll be believed. But just because it's believed still doesn't mean that it's true. And so there is an importance in having accurate information. I'll give you an example. This has nothing to do with what I'm preaching today other than I want to demonstrate the, the, the fact of the importance of knowledge because I just stumbled on this a few days ago. There was a YouGov poll that was taken and they conducted a series of polls and they asked several questions of people um, to identify what general perception is versus what reality is. For example, they asked about six or seven uh, questions and they said, how many people in America make over $500,000 a year? Well, the estimated number, according to the polls, most Americans uh, were saying that they guessed it to be about 26%. That's pretty cool, if it were true. The actual number is only 1%. Only 1% of people out of 330 million make even a half a million dollars a year. So most of us are pretty close to the same bucket, I think. <laughs> They asked questions, again, interrelated or non-related. They said, how many left-handed people are there in, in, in the nation? And the, the general poll said, uh, guess that there's about 34% of the people. A third of the people are left-handed. <laughs> the, the actual number is only 11%. They asked, what's the Hispanic population of America? In a certain place you go, you'd think it's 90%. But the national reality, and they guessed this, they said, well, we'd say the national average is about 39%. The reality is, the perception is 39%. The reality is 17%. What's the black population of America? The perception was that it's 41%. The reality is it's 12%. How many people are vegan or vegetarian, according to the YouGov poll? People guessed the perception was that 30% of the nation is vegan. That's not true. It's only 5%. And I'm convinced a lot of them cheat. <laughs> YouGov asked how many people in America are, are in the nation are gay or lesbian. The perception was 30%. Truth is, it's only 3%. How many people in America are transgender? They guessed 21%. The perception is 1%. There's less transgender people in the world or in the nation than there are that make over half a million a year. And it's true in biblical things as well. If I were to ask most people on the street, how many, how many uh, animals, how did the animals come into the ark? And most people would say, well, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember from Sunday school. seems like they came in by twos, but that's not really the truth. Uh, the, the Bible says that, the, that the, the unclean animals came in by twos, but the clean animals came in by sevens. All I'm trying to say is, is that, is that there, is, there is perception and then there is reality. And if there is anything that we need today on this Easter Sunday uh, is to not just have a perception about Calvary. Uh, we need to have a reality about Calvary. We need to know the real truth. Not just trying to remember a vague Sunday school story from when we were children. Because if there's anything that we don't need to be guessing about it's something of this importance. And, and you can't trust water cooler discussions around the job place uh, as being authoritative. Uh, and we've come this Easter because in general we know that Jesus rose from the dead. I appreciate the choir songs today. Uh, he got up. He got up. That's what we're celebrating today. But it was the first song that they sang was really the reason behind it all. Uh, is there was no greater love. Dr love is what drew him to the cross. It drove him to the 
the cross. Uh, and love is what caused him to raise again. Then the prophet Zechariah, back in 520 B.C., he, he spoke of the, the coming of Jesus Christ. And, and, and he, he showed in the vision, he said he, he could see the Messiah. And he asked him, he said, someone was going to ask, what are these wounds in thine hand? What, what, what is this about, Jesus? What are those scars for? Why are your hands scarred? He said, the answer will come back. I was wounded in the house of my friends. I was wounded among those that I had come to seek and to save. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the most momentous, amazing day in history. It literally is, is a, a, the hinges upon which history swings. And they have statistics on everything, including the crucifixion. Besides the execution itself, it said that that day there were 25 significant events that took place from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. that afternoon. Now, there were things such as the soldiers offering the vinegar, the gambling that took place at the foot of the cross, two thieves that Jesus reached out to on either side. There was three hours of darkness. There was a temple veil that rent uh, uh, at, at the time of his death. There was a, uh, an earthquake that took place. There was a, a rich man that stepped up to, to cause the, him to be buried. And I, all of these things were added up. The, the stats say 25. There were also, uh, I don't know who counted this stuff, there was also somebody said there were 10 major decisions that were made that day. Things like Jesus refusing the vinegar that was offered to him on the cross. Uh, Pilate making the confirmation that he was indeed uh, dead before they were sent off to bury him. Uh, women made the decision to leave the cross, etc., etc. It is noted that at Calvary there were 16 notable statements that were made by various people. Of, of those that were not Jesus himself, probably the most dramatic of all the statements made at the cross was made at the very end by that Roman soldier who noted, surely this was the Son of God. You know, it's a sad time when you realize one day too late that this really was truth. And in reality, it's not always just one day. Sometimes in his case, it was one minute. If I'd have really taken this stuff serious, I, I, I would have I dealt with it differently than the way I, I I wouldn't have been so nonchalant about it. Of those 16 notable statements... There were seven of them that were made by Jesus himself. It's known as the seven famous statements, the last statements of Jesus Christ in his life. And in order, the first one he spoke to was to the Spirit of God itself when he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And then he spoke to the thief that was on the cross next to him when he said, Truly, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. A little bit later during this death process, he, he spoke to his mother and to the disciple John when he said, Woman, behold your son. And he said to John, Behold your mother. He was taking care of his mother. He was literally giving John the, the, uh, the instructions that after I'm gone, you take care of mom. And then the next one he made was the statement he made again back to God when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? More time dissolved in the pain and the agony of the cross until finally he spoke up again seemingly to no one when he just made the statement, I thirst. But it was the last two statements that he made that became most powerful. He cried out with a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh, and then he spoke those words and died uh, when he said those last three words, it is finished. 
And that was a powerful statement because the Jews that were standing there understood uh, that what, and I just taught this in, this, in the teaching series on Wednesday nights, uh, that, that, the, that that's what the Old Testament priests said uh, when they were done making the, uh, the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. Uh, their final words is, it is finished. Uh, it is finished. It was a declaration of a high priest. And when Jesus said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His last words were quoting the prophecy of King David that came from Psalms uh, 31 and 5 when he said, into thine hand I commit my spirit. Uh, Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Uh, There were so many things that happened on that day. There were so many things that were said on that day. But there was only one grand sacrifice that took place that day. And there was only one man that could accomplish it. It was Jesus himself, uh, the Lamb of God. And what took place that day became something that would change the history of the world. It only took a few verses in your Bible to tell the story of what happened. But since that time, it has been untold volumes had been written and recorded that keep writing the results. And the books aren't finished yet. It's still being written. And the most famous of all is the book of life. I'm telling you, that book is still being written as well. And names are still being added to that book. It's a result of what happened from a few verses 2,000 years ago. What a day. Jesus is so central, such a central figure to history. This poor carpenter son that came from a very poor family became the most recognized human being, the most recognized name in the history of the world. Here we are in the 21st century, and still this unknown poor carpenter, Jerusalem, Nazareth, has affected the entire world. You can't just ignore that. You can't just pretend that it has no purpose or reason. And the thing is, it's not what he did or said in his short life uh, that made as much impact as what happened after his short life. Uh, Just a couple of days later, uh, as the choir was singing, he got up. Uh, It wasn't just that he died, but he rose again. Uh, Oh, that changed the history of the world. So today we celebrate Easter Sunday, as we should. The Apostle Paul If you bring up 1 Corinthians 15 on screen, the Apostle Paul put it in the right setting when he said, And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. I want you to understand that Christianity, all of Christianity, absolutely rides uh, on the foundation and the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, uh, ain't none of this matters. Every bit of it is in vain. Yea, verse 15, uh, you were, we were found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, uh, whom he raised not up. If, if he raised not up, but we testified that he did. He said, if so be that the dead raise not. For if, everybody say if, mm-hmm. the dead raise not, then is not Christ raised And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. Then they that fell asleep in Christ are perished. And if in this life only we have hope, we are above all men most miserable. Paul was literally saying, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then every one of us are still in our sins. And everyone that has died before us is still in their sins. This is major stuff that rests on this. That's why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is literally the hope of the world. And so today we take time to celebrate it and rejoice it and remember it. And we should. And thank God for it. Uh, Thank God that he got up. Thank God for an empty tomb. Uh, But yet in the spirit today, after just touching on it, but I feel like that's not what what the Holy Ghost is is asking me to, to focus on for a minute. I want to go back a couple of days before the resurrection. I want to go back to what Zechariah prophesied would be asked. What are these wounds that are in your hands? Prior to the cross, 
Jesus experienced severe abuse. He suffered physical abuse. He suffered verbal abuse. He suffered mental abuse. He suffered spiritual abuse. He suffered incredible warfare with demons. I taught on that a few Wednesday nights ago about the, 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 the little verse from the Old Testament that talks about the bulls of Bashan. Was, was referring to demon spirits that were, that were attacking the mind of Jesus while he's going through this weakened time. Many years ago, early in American uh, culture, Jonathan Edwards preached a, a message that stirred New England at the time. It's, it's noted as, as the beginning of one of the spiritual awakenings that America had. But he preached a famous message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It was a message of judgment and a message of the need of repentance and so forth. It shook New England at the time. But I would tell you that when you look back at Calvary, Calvary was a day when God was in the hands of angry sinners. It was the exact opposite. And unless you know the purpose, you can't assume it. You can't, you can't just, you got to know uh, that, that sometimes there's a difference between what we think we know and what truth really is. And it's, it's important that, that you don't pass over lightly what was the purpose of the suffering. What was, I know people that don't walk with God because in their mind they think that's so dumb. Why all the bloodshed? Why all the, the, unless you understand the purpose of it, uh, you'll never get it. But when you see the purpose of it and when you understand the reasoning behind it, all of a sudden that which made no sense uh, becomes the most beautiful story that's ever been told. Jesus' wounds were not wasted wounds. They had a purpose to them. Why did God allow it? Why did he put up with the Romans? After all, as the one songwriter said, he could have called 10,000 angels and tore Jerusalem up. I am so glad he didn't. Because had he done that, you and I would not have the opportunities that we have you have to understand the reality that Jesus was not doing this for himself. He was doing this for us. He was a substitute for us. He was taking our place. Everybody say, me. Calvary was about you. And until you are able to take Calvary and, and let it become personal, until you can look in the mirror and realize you were the reason for this, Never grasp it. He was abused, not for his own doing. He was abused on our behalf. It was not his own sin. He who knew no sin took on the sin of the whole world. And the prophet Isaiah, back up in the 53rd chapter, bring it up on screen. The prophet Isaiah saw what was to come. He said in verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, uh, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him, but he was despised, and we esteemed him not. But you have to understand why. It's not enough to know that Jesus suffered. you got to know why. A lot of people suffer. A lot of people have wounds. A lot of people have scars, uh, but they're not... They're not great justified stories behind them. Some of them come from our own foolishness. Some of them come from the recklessness of others. And some of us have some wasted wounds in our body. I've got three scars. I've got a scar on each knee from when I was young. One was a, a young kid riding a bicycle fast came around a corner and there was some loose gravel and woo, everything went up and running. My knee hit the ground and cut a chunk out. I got a scar to this day from that. Begin to wonder where my little grandchild gets some of his stuff from. He come running in my office this morning, scared me. He come running in my office around the corner. He hit his foot on, 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 on something and went. he literally went airborne. <laughs> And I couldn't get to him. In fact, he went airborne head first. Didn't even put his hand up. He went head first into the trash can. 
knocked that trash can over and up, and he splowed out on the floor. I'm, I'm, oh man, Jordan, you all right? You're right. He gets up, you know, he puts all the trash back, and I said, Are you all right? I looked at, I said, You all right? And he said, You want to see my boo boo? <laughs> Kid, you're scaring me to death. <laughs> But I, got, I had a scar on one knee from when I was young, but it didn't teach me anything because the other scar on the other knee came from a little few years later when I was riding a motorcycle instead of a bike. Flying across the field, not paying attention, I hit an open gopher hole. Hit that thing, the bike went in the air, I went in the air, the bike, me, flipped over, and I landed, the bike landed on me. I got... Knee on my on my pants is all red, blood coming out of my knee, and I'm out in the middle of a field somewhere. I had to make my way back in, and I, but but uh, well, you know, but Pastor, surely you learned something from all that. Uh, not so much. The wounds I created on my bicycle didn't change me because it just allowed me to have more wounds on my motorcycle later. Another one happened when I was a kid too. That, I, I, we we were playing we were playing roller derby. Me and my neighbor's kids we were playing roller derby. Well, you know we didn't, have, but we were so poor we didn't have any skates. <laughs> and even if we did, we didn't have anywhere to do it. So we were just running around the house, uh, pretending that that was the was the rink, and we were playing roller derby. You know, so what you do in roller derby, you come around, and whenever you see somebody, you know, you plow into them, you try to knock them down, you try to wing them around, you know, so we were doing all that, and I came running full speed right around the corner of the house, and I didn't know my neighbor Eddie had stopped there for a minute, and wham, I went into him, man, my teeth went through my whole chin here, blood gushing out, they rushed me to the hospital, or to the doctor's office, I guess what, and they, they, they put a, I remember, I remember this vision for, for this, I'm laying there, and all of a sudden they, they drape a, a, a thing over me with a hole so the doctor could focus on it, and as a kid, I'm thinking, oh God, I'm dying, <laughs> but I got a scar to this day, they, put, they had to put sutures in there, but to this day, I got a scar right there, don't ask to look at it, you'll... <laughs> I see it almost every day whenever I shave and I'm you know, in the mirror and I say, I see it, I see it. I, what did you learn from it, Pastor? Not a thing. Because all of my wounds are wasted wounds. They were just wounds that came from damage. But I can't testify that the damage changed anything in me. It didn't change the way I think. It didn't change the way I acted. And it didn't keep me from continuing to have more wounds. And until you come to a place where your wounds begin to change uh, your activity and change how you think, uh, you'll just have ongoing wounds that you keep wounding yourself over and over again, uh, putting yourself in the same situations over and over again. And the sad thing is uh, they are, you're, you're, you're wasted. they're wasted wounds. Because they're unproductive. But that's not, what, that's not what Jesus had. What are those wounds in your hand? These are the wounds that came from the house of my friends. And, but, but, but Isaiah said it. And I, I'm back up in verse 4. Again, you've got to understand why. He said, surely he hath borne our griefs. Everybody say, our griefs. And carried our sorrows. And we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed over and over again. It's our, it's our, it's our, it's we. I, I want you to understand there were five dimensions of sacrifice uh, that Isaiah wrote about uh, that Jesus went through uh, and it was all about us uh, because because of his wounds, uh, you and I can be healed <clears throat> here's what the Holy Ghost has come in my spirit to say to every one of us today I beg you I beg you today don't allow his wounds 
to be wasted on you. Don't allow his wounds to have no effect on your life. Don't allow his wounds to bring no change in your thinking. Verse 6 says that all we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. None of us would deal with our sin. None of us would address the issue of our sin. And so God took the sin of the whole world and placed it on the Lamb of God. And Calvary was all about Jesus. But Jesus was all about us. Hebrews chapter 12 is why the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, everybody say consider him, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, uh, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. I've got news for you. There is nothing uh, that can strengthen a weary mind or strengthen the human mind more than when you take time to consider him. <laughs> consider what he's done for us. So today I take a few minutes and I'm asking us to consider the wounds that Jesus said came in the house of his friends. Matthew 27 on screen, the first thing that happened was the soldiers took him into the great hall. The Bible says they stripped him and they put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited or plated, that means twisted, a crown of thorns. Everybody say a crown. They put it on his head with a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they spit upon him. And this is something sometimes we overlook. <clears throat> they took the reed and smote him on the head. There was a reason for that. And when they smote him on the head, they were pushing those thorns deeper into his skull. And after that, they mocked him and they took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. I, I wish that I had the eloquence to really paint the picture of what happened that day, but I don't feel I do. But I just want to say everything that God does, everything that he orders up, has order and purpose to it. And when they <clears throat> twisted up a crown of thorns and pressed it into his body, the Bible says they pressed it. It wasn't just laid on his head. It was pressed into his head. One of the seven places that Jesus bled from in his body was the skull because of those thorns. They were just mocking and they may not have totally understood. I'll explain something about what I think was in the Romans' minds when they did it. But I'll tell you what was in God's minds, what was in the Spirit's minds. Because when you go all the way back to the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and when they were expelled from the garden, part of the, part of the, the, the communication or the judgment from God that came uh, upon mankind uh, and upon the earth was that it would bring forth thorns and thistles from this point on. And now here is the Son of God uh, having the, the curse reversed onto Him. Thorns were placed under this thing on His head. And, 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 and there's a little obscure verse in, in Hebrews 6. Bring up verse 8. The Apostle Paul wrote this. Uh, he said, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Uh, you see, that was, uh, that was in the Jewish mind because of the history of what thorns and thistles were. Uh, in the Jewish mind, anybody that gets thorns and thistles placed on them, was it meant they were cursed. 
and everything that was cursed should have been should have been rejected and then burned what they would have done with Jesus body uh, is after the crucifixion they would have taken him to the valley of Hinnon uh, outside of the uh, of the, the the side of the city where they burned all the refuse and all the trash uh, and they would have burned up his body uh, in all of that uh, but that was not God's purpose that was not God's will uh, and so what would have happened uh, is not what happened because the Holy Ghost stepped in uh, and a member of the Sanhedrin court by the name uh, of Joseph of Arimathea had stepped in and the Bible says begged for the body of Jesus uh, and, and, and so Pilate decided that's one of those major decisions that day to let him have it but those thorns represented mental anguish just like roses Life has both beauty and tragedy to it. And there's not a one of our lives that we can't look to and see the painful times of, 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 of the thorns and the thistles, and yet at the same time there's a, a beautiful rose as well. And our life represents all that. And when they placed that crown, they were doing it to mock him. They, they knew what the Jewish thinking was. They knew that what they, they were, they, in their mind, they were probably just doing it for that reason. But the truth is, uh, is I believe it goes back to the book of Genesis and what the purpose of the thorns was and how everything, Satan was unloosing everything he could back against the Son of God. And then they took that reed and they begin to smote him in the head. And they would smote him on that crown of thorns. And it was driving those thorns and thistles uh, into his skull. Blood was coming down from his head. Uh, and as they began to beat him into his head, what is amazing uh, is that to spite the thorns that were going into his skull, to spite the blood, to spite the, the hitting upon the head, uh, you know, it doesn't take all that much to knock somebody out. Have you ever occurred or let it occur to think uh, that it's amazing that Jesus maintained his consciousness in all of that? Many people died before they even got to crucifixion. As a matter of fact, many people died during the cat of nine tails, the whipping and the scourging that took place before they crucified people. A lot of people died of blood loss. As a matter of fact, it was noted <coughs> that that 40 seemed to be about the time that people started to die. So the Jews uh, came up with a, a ruling and said that 39, 40 save one. We're going to take you to the edge of death. But we want to keep you alive so we can put you on a cross. Finish the job there. But to spite these blows to the head, it is phenomenal to note that Jesus was still clear-headed all the way to the end. I believe he was able to make those seven statements from the cross because despite the pain and despite the anguish and despite the beating, uh, the Holy Ghost was helping to maintain his mind. Everything else was breaking down, but he still had his mind because he had to fulfill every obscure Old Testament prophecy. For example, bring up Isaiah 49. But Zion said, uh, the Lord hath forsaken me and my Lord hath forgotten me. Uh, but he said, can a woman forget her sucking child? Uh, and I shall not have compassion on the son of her womb yea they may forget uh, yet I will never forget the uh, it was prophesied back in the Old Testament God said I will never forget you so even while he was being beaten despite the beatings to his head despite all the damage that was done to his head he still maintained consciousness and he remained cognizant because he had to remember who he was. And he had to remember why he was. He was the son of God on assignment to seek and to save that which was lost. And just as, just as Satan attacked Jesus' mind in a physical manner, he attacks us as well in our minds. As a matter of fact, most of spiritual warfare is, is, is really played out in the mind. And he wants, just like he wanted Jesus to forget, he wants us to forget. He wants us to forget God's promises in times of trouble. He wants us to forget our faith. He wants us to forget God's goodness. Uh, that's why we're told, put on the helmet of salvation. 
can help protect our mind from crazy thinking at times. But they not only attacked his head, the Bible says they spit in his face. Matthew 26 uh, on screen. Then they spit in his face and buffeted him, and the others smote him with the palms of their hands, uh, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, to who is he that smote thee? Uh, I want you to understand, he was beaten on top of all this stuff. Numbers of people were coming up, slapping him and hitting him, and making fun. Come on, tell us who's doing it. And they spit in his face specifically because they wanted to degrade him and humiliate him. In the Old Testament, Miriam, Moses' sister, rebelled for a season and God smote her with leprosy. And Moses made an appeal unto God. Listen to what God said. Numbers 12. And Moses said, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received again. Even, even God acknowledged that the spitting in the face is for the purpose of humiliation. There are other examples throughout the Old Testament that, that say the same thing. It, 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 the Jewish mind understood that, that if, if you're being spit upon, it, it is a, it's an issue of condemnation. And there was no doubt in my mind that those Roman guards knew that about Jewish custom. And that was exactly what they were doing to him as a Jew. They spat on his face to condemn him and bring condemnation because, as it's always been, one of Satan's number one tools that he uses against us is condemnation. He mimics God's conviction, which is a beautiful thing. And he creates his own version of it. It's called condemnation. And sometimes it's tricky when you're dealing with them to try to figure out which is which, because sometimes they feel an awful lot alike. But even though they feel alike, I tell you this, there is a great difference uh, between the two of them. Uh, when God is convicting us about something, uh, it's drawing us toward Him. Uh, it makes us want to come to church. It makes us want to come pray. Uh, it makes us want to weep before Him. Uh, that's when God is drawing and, and pulling. Uh, but when you're feeling condemnation, that's saying uh, you have failed and, you, and, and God's left you and all that. God you see, one the conviction draws you toward God. Condemnation always pushes you away from God. So if you're feeling guilt and shame and, and anxiety or, or somehow you felt God so much that He could never recover you and stuff, that is not the conviction of the Holy Ghost. That's the condemnation of the devil. As a matter of fact, Romans 8 on screen says, There is now therefore no condemnation. To them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Condemnation should not be able to work on us but we allow it to sometimes. Jesus carried our condemnation so that we can be free. But the reason that we can be free of condemnation is because of his wounds that were taken place. I think the truth is, I think we just greatly underestimate the grace of God. I think sometimes we greatly underestimate the mercy of God. I think we expect God to run out of a patience with us because we compare God to us. And in our mind, we know, I'd, I wouldn't put up with that. I'd have cut that person off a long time ago. I'd have done this. I'd have done that. But ain't none of us in charge of this thing we're not here because of what we would have done. We're here because of what he's doing. And you'll tend to have a whole lot more compassion towards your own children than you do everybody else's. And I would remind every one of us today, we are the children of God. At least by creation, if not by new birth. They not only hit him, Humbled him, spit on him. Bible says they plucked his beard from his face. There is ironically not any specific New Testament verse that tells that they did it, 
but we know that it happened because he fulfilled all scripture. And Isaiah 50 in the Old Testament says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So they hit him, they spit upon him, they literally yanked his beard out of him. I don't know how painful that is. Because in the Old Testament, the beard was a sign of manhood. And conquering armies would come in, and if they took over and won, they would shave a man's head and shave his face and just make him totally uh, without any kind of beard or whatever because it was meant to subjugate, to degrade. And in our day, I see an incredible attack. There's an effeminate spirit that's attacking mankind, manhood in our nation. Satan mocks us by mocking God's plan for masculinity. God created masculinity. God created femininity. He created them male and female. Satan comes along trying to attack every bit of it on either side, either angle, anything he can do to, to mess it up in our minds, anything he can do. I, I saw a meme the other day. It said, teach your boys to be men before the world teaches them how to be women. Can I remind you something? 1 Corinthians 6, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Yeah, yeah, we get all of that. Nor effeminate. Nor abuser themselves with mankind. That word effeminate in the Greek was, meant soft or academite. It was literally, it literally was a form of uh, the softness of homosexuality and weakness of men. So Satan fights everything that's creational order. And before they took him to the cross, they flogged him with a Roman flogrum. It uh, sometimes was known as a cat of nine tails. It was a handle that had nine strips of leather on it. And at the end of each leather, there was tied a piece of glass or a particularly sharp stone so that every time that the cat of nine tails would whip upon the flesh, they would, they would take it and whip it on the and then pull it. So that as it pulled across the flesh, it would tear and cut and rip. Two soldiers would tie somebody to a post and take the clothes off of their back till their back was exposed. Uh, and then they would begin to whip them 39 times with a cat of nine tails. Again, many people died just from that, the blood loss. It caused deep cuts and contusions. Uh, the, the, they, they called them stripes because it literally was stripes. It was whips. It would whip upon the body. And, the, and, and when it would come around, it would bite into the skin. And then the, then the soldier would pull on it and it would rip flesh around with it. Thirty-nine times, Dr. Dale Robbins put an article in the AMA many years ago speculating that there was 39 root uh, diseases that you could divide diseases in. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's accurate. It's a speculative thing. I've never seen really a list of that. I don't know, you know how you do it, but I know this. It doesn't matter whether that's true fully or not. The reality is what the book says about it is true. And Peter wrote it this way in 1 Peter 2, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. We are, salvation was purchased for us through the cross, but healing virtue was purchased through the beating of the cat of nine tails. And the wounds, the stripes that produce scars. I said it earlier, I have scars. I'm sure everybody in here can point to some scars here and there, but the thing is, you don't want to have wasted scars. 
And so the Holy Ghost is saying to us today, are you going to allow his wounds to be wasted on you? Jesus, what are those wounds? These. What are those scars for? These are not wasted scars. These scars have a purpose. These scars change the life of people. These scars brought deliverance to people. These scars have a purpose. Uh, and, 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 well, but, but what do they mean? Uh, it, it means John 1 and 11. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Uh, he was wounded in the house of his friends. Uh, but his wounds were not wasted wounds. Uh, <clears throat> five levels uh, he was oppressed, rejected, despised, wounded, afflicted. He was smitten with grief and sorrow. And finally, the writer of Hebrews wrote it this way in chapter 4. He said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest uh, that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. In other words, no matter what, hang on! For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. His wounds were not wasted wounds. His wounds had redemptive purpose. He died for us. But we cannot just know that. We've got to respond to it some way. And verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Uh, you see, God so loved the world that He gave uh, His only begotten Son. God so loved the world, He gave us a way out. I want some of our musicians, if you'll begin to join me on the platform. I know this isn't a normal Easter message. Most of the time when we gather on Easter, it's high gear, celebration, and joy. And that is, I believe, what it should be most of the time. But for some reason, for weeks now, I've been feeling the Holy Ghost say, I don't want you to focus on the resurrection as much as I want you to focus on the wounds and I'm I'm begging you this morning I, I have not preached this eloquent enough to to really get it across but I'm asking the Holy Ghost somehow to help us to see it and feel it the way he was wanting us to see and feel it because Jesus did not go to the cross just so that you and I can go on to hell. He went to the cross and bore the wounds in the house of his friends so that you and I could have a reaction to it. And I'm begging you this morning. Don't let his wounds be wasted on you. Oh, they weren't wasted because... Millions through the course of history have responded and been redeemed and born again. The issue is not whether or not Jesus' wounds were wasted in general. They weren't. The issue this morning is whether they are going to be wasted on you. First Corinthians 15, I'll leave you with this verse. So is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Quickening means to bring alive. What are those wounds, Jesus? Every one of us as individuals need to ask him that question this morning. And his answer is going to be the same. These are the wounds that I had in the house of my friends. 
but they are for you. Stand with me this morning. I wonder if you just close your eyes for a minute and just join in with our musicians as they sing. Lord, I'm thankful
I know oftentimes in years past when we've gathered on Easter Sunday, we've always had the, again, celebratory mode. But I truly feel in the Holy Ghost. Sometimes folks come just for the celebration, but it never changes them. When you begin to consider his wounds, it brings, as a matter of fact, you can't really celebrate that. You can rejoice in the in the resurrection, but there's no way to put your mind on the wounds and the suffering of Christ and be giddy about it. It it doesn't it doesn't foster that kind of a spirit. It fosters a soberness and a somberness. Sometimes that's the very presence that we need to take communion on. So on this Easter Sunday, we haven't done communion at Easter for a while, but I felt like that it was important this year to do it. So the Apostle Paul said, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which was broken. Everybody say broken. Say it again. Say it again. Communion is about remembering the cost of the cross. My body was broken for you. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner he took the cup and when he had supped he said this cup is the New Testament in my blood. And if you do this, as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Communion is about remembering the wounds and remembering the bloodshed. Oh, it leads us to a place of celebration. But it has to first lead us to a place of brokenness. He said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Unworthily just means without thought, without sincerity, without seriousness. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not have to be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord that he should not be condemned with the world. I want to tell you what communion is all about. Communion is about not wasting the wounds of Jesus on us. Ultimately, what we have to do is we need to repent of our sin. And ultimately, we need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of that sin. And God will fill us with the baptism of His Spirit. And all, all of that's the, a new birth process. But I feel this morning what the Lord's challenging us to is to receive him with communion. As a, as a step of faith, as a way of wanting to not waste the wounds of Jesus on me, God, I'm going to come to the table today and I'm going to take a time of communion. And the communion today represents the fact that I want to begin to pursue you better than I've ever pursued you before. That today is the launching day of something new. I don't want your wounds wasted on me. So 
our pastors are here by the table to assist if it's needed, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you want to participate in communion today, I'm going to invite you as the singers begin to sing in a minute. I want you to come to the table. Wait a minute. I want you to come to the table, and I want you to take one of these uh, communion cups. I don't want you to do anything with it yet. I just want you to pick it up, and I want you to come find a place to stand around the altars, around the first few pews, just anywhere that you can, but I want you to just get one of these in your hand ready, and then we'll give instruction that we're going to do it all together. Amen? So if you want to be a part of this and receive this this morning, come as we sing. In the name of Jesus. lift your voice and just talk to God now for a minute. Why don't you just talk to God? Jesus, I've come today. Lord, I've preached this morning about the wounds. Lord, they spit in your face for my sake. They beat you with that kind of nine tails for my sake. 
Lord, they drove those nails into your hands and feet for my sake. They drove that crown of thorns into your head for my sake. I don't want your wounds to be wasted on me. Everybody said amen. I want you to very carefully, if you'll take the cup that you have on the side of the wafer and just peel it open and get the wafer in your hand very carefully. Then after you do that, spin it over and peel back the top. We're going to do this together, but I want you to understand something today, especially those of you that are our guests. I want you to want to be clear about something. We've invited us to come and take communion today, but this does not provide you salvation. That's not what communion is. Communion was designed. <coughs> the New Testament church <coughs> doesn't have many sacraments in it. The Old Testament was full of them. The New Testament only has a couple. Probably the chiefest of all is communion. But the purpose of this New Testament sacrament is not to provide salvation. It is simply to provide an attention and a focus on Calvary. It's to focus us on the body. That that wafer that we have, it's, sim it's just symbolism. But he said that is the body that's broken from us. So when we take this, what, we're, what we need to put onto our mind is I want you to be thinking about the wounds of Christ that was shed for me, that was done for me. The blood was shed. But Again, I, I, wish, I, I wish I was more eloquent. I wish I was able to. If I was eloquent, I, I, I could preach it in such a way that every one of us be full of tears but I, I just don't have that eloquence but the Holy Ghost is here very strong right now what we're about to do isn't saving us but I will tell you this if you'll do it with sincerity and, and in essence this morning we're going to take communion and say Lord don't let your wounds be wasted on me Today, on this Easter Sunday, is going to be the beginning of something new. Take the wafer in your hand. And, and as the Apostle Paul reminded us, it's what Jesus did when he broke the bread. He said, this bread is symbolic of my body that was broken for you. The wounds that were suffered for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and take the wafer. Oh, hallelujah. I'll take the cup. And he said, as often as you drink it, this cup represents symbolically the blood of Jesus that was shed on that cross. The wounds for me and the blood is for me. As often as you do it, take and drink. This is the blood of my New Testament. Oh, hallelujah. Now I want you to just begin to talk to God and just begin to minister to the Spirit of God. Hariola mashandarataya. Oh, Jesus. Lord, on this Easter Sunday morning, we take communion together to remember the cross and remember the wounds, remember the suffering. 
want our ministers that are around to begin to minister to some people that are around you. Some of our Holy Ghost filled saints to begin to just pray for people around you for just a few minutes before we leave. Halamata Hashem, today's the beginning of something new. Just in your own words, talk to God. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. That's it. Begin to pray for one another. If you've brought a guest with you today, pray with them. Hallelujah. Just picture yourself today at the foot of the cross. We're all standing at the foot of the cross. Jesus. God, let your spirit move in this house right now. Let your anointing begin to flow in this house. Lord, I'm asking you to let that spirit that only you can bring draw people to you. Let them feel the power of the cross. Let them feel the power of redemption. Stir their hunger. That's it. Just lift your hands unto the Lord as a symbol of submission. And just begin to worship His name. We pray for one another. This is beautiful. There is a beautiful presence of God right now. The angels of the Lord are in the house right now. God, let us feel the
and you're sick in your body and you need a healing in your body I want you to make your way as best you can to this communion table Brother Jeremiah our evangelist is here with some oil Brother Towns is going to join him and we're going to anoint you with oil and we're going to pray because the, the Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions uh, by his stripes we are healed uh, part of what God brought healing for uh, it's because of the wounds that were here. And I believe God's going to allow his wounds and the power of it to extend uh, to some healing in this house uh, as we continue to pray and worship. Hallelujah.
the river of the Spirit of God. There's a flow and a touch that's taking place. You don't feel this in Kmart. You don't feel this in the store. This is the presence in the house of God.
again for what you've done for us. And I thank you, Lord, for the wounds that were shed, for the blood that was shed and the wounds that were endured. Everybody said amen. One more time, all over this house, would you clap your hands unto the Lord and give God a shout of praise and victory and thanks. It's Easter Sunday. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. couple of quick things I want to share with you. One, just as a note, they handed me a note from the office somebody gave this morning with an envelope that was written in pink ink, but there was no name on it. If you want us to have a name, if you'll just let us know down here at the table, we'll take care of that and fix it for you. But today, there's no service this evening. I want us to gather today, get together with family and friends, and I want you to but it's to celebrate and remember Easter. Everybody say Easter. On Mother's Day and Father's Day, we're going to do the same thing because we want you to be planning on special times to honor your mother, honor your father. If your mother or father, like mine, are not here, then find somebody else to honor. and, and find, It's the principles we're honoring. One last thing I want to tell you about just so you know that it's coming, but seven weeks from Easter is Pentecost Sunday. And on Pentecost Sunday, it's the first week of June this year, we're going to have one big service here on Sunday morning, a combined service like this one. But Sunday night, several of our churches here in the Tidewater area are dismissing our Sunday night service, and we're going to gather at the New Life building out in Chesapeake, the building we used to have the One Conferences in, and we're going to have a section-wide Holy Ghost rally that night and pray people through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost evangelist Doug Kleindance is going to be with us. It's going to be a great time in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Again, as you leave today, we wish you a happy Easter. Thank you for being faithful to God's house. But just one last time, I beg you, don't let the wounds of Jesus be wasted upon you. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of Jesus. Love one another. Greet one another in the name of the Lord.